income security. Citizen wealth actually sounds like such an important term, and I just sort of love that term, but stripped down, bare naked, income security. In 2009, when the book was published, that kind of had a meaning, but now after several years of the recession that started in 2007, we all have a better view of what income security means. Because a lot of people have found that you don't have that security whatsoever. In the book, I argued, and pretty much any time I have an opportunity, that you can build organizations that can create citizen wealth if you're willing to think strong and to think big. Too often, people think of community organizations, and this happened as I was getting into work, as things that deal with stop signs in the neighborhood. Well, I think the history of ACORN as it, as it was built was that if you put enough pieces together, you can build real power that's much different than the derogatory uh, accusations of being stop sign builders. A couple of examples on that. In 1978, with other organizations, the passage of the Community Reinvestment Act, which one might argue is the single largest accomplishment of community organizers in our generation of work. In that act, we achieved something of the pursuit of equity across race and many other areas that had to do with stopping the red line in banks. The combined agreements that evolved over several decades led to at least 7 million, conservatively, 7 million working families, low and low income families, acquiring homes and home ownership for the first time. Acorn's share of that was probably about 4 million of those homes came from agreements we negotiated. It's one of the, the tragedies of our time today that so little is being done and still so much of individual wealth is captured in people's real estate that this has been such a singly, uh, it's one of the largest disappointments of the Obama administration is their inability to address the issues of foreclosure and home valuation and banking extravagance and don't get me started. Because um, I'm on citizen wealth. Another thing that uh, we did and we talk about is what I call maximum eligible participation. We sometimes think, well, what can we do on the, I know you can't read this, hang with me, hang with me. Um, we sometimes think that you can't address national issues, which is um, community organizations are often shackled with that. And the, the concept that drove ACORN, and I still believe very strongly, is if you put enough pieces together, that changes in a radical way. We may not have the ability in the kind of climate congressionally that exists today to pass new laws. But it turns out within existing formations, existing legal structures, there are huge opportunities to increase those in wealth. That list is every state and who's on, who's eligible, and who isn't. Um, the things like earned income tax credits. LAHEAP, which is low-income uh, low energy assistance, food stamps. Here's Ohio, since I knew I was talking to Ohioans and you all would care about this. Left on the table in Ohio, almost $3 billion that could be in people's pockets. And no, they can't repeal many of these laws because they're federal. And they might like to, but you can't. Nationally, it just gets worse, and I won't you know, make you wallow in it, but. $83 billion, if you had state to state, $83 billion in just these half dozen programs exist for people to receive, and they aren't getting it. And part of what we did is try to create campaigns and activities for people to access those benefits. Another uh, important, I think, one of the most important accomplishments in ACORN's time when I was there was building community labor alliances to deal with what we call living wage campaigns. Once again, I'm going to use Ohio and Florida as examples. We were involved in about 125 campaigns. We ended up winning some level of about 100. They were small in some places as contract campaigns where maybe two or 300 workers got a little bit of an increase. Certainly that's not the revolution in our time. 
But what made a difference at the end of the day was when we started moving to what I believe were geographical plans. And my brothers and sisters in labor would understand that living wage campaigns were essentially prevailing wage campaigns. How do we move prevailing wages up from the bottom? And although this was hard to sell to some unions because you were getting benefits without the benefit of collective bargaining, for unions and community groups to come together to move this made a huge difference. Here in Ohio, ACORN led the effort, along with many allies, to put a proposition on the ballot in 2006, which moved the minimum wage in the state from 515 to 725. In Florida, two years before, 2004, a similar thing only moved the dollar. We were very pragmatic about it. If you look at the, this is where this is so fancy, this is such fun. Did you see that? <laughs> I can't believe it. Um, you look at the number of workers, look at that. Half million workers in Ohio got a raise from this category. Three quarters of a million in, in uh, Florida. And Florida's other country, a lot like this. This is where Ohio people go, Florida. And part of the reason they're going might be. The bottom line, let me do this again. $1.3 billion. Just winning that as soon as it went into impact, into effect. That increase, of course, was $2 an hour. If you happen to be working full time, that's a $4,000 raise. I hate to tell you the number of union contracts I've bargained. Maybe other people would be honest or not honest about this. But there's a lot of contracts I've bargained where people don't get $4,000 in a year from that contract. I know it's hard to believe, and I'm sorry, but I'm willing to tell you. Uh, this is the truth. In Florida, $2.2 billion. And this is a gift that keeps on giving because they were indexed, not like the federal minimum wage and Fair Labor Standards Act, but every time inflation moves and there's a check on CPI every year, it bumps up. So what we want in Florida, let's see if I go back, 615, is now somewhere close to $8 in Florida. Now we're so hard campaigns. They don't say pretty things about you. But delivers for your members, it delivers for the constituency. It is part of the promise of what community labor coalitions can really build. And that's part of why I believe that these kinds of coalitions can be so important. If you looked at Acorn campaign victories in a 10-year period, you know, there was a couple years where we got some dollars from, from foundations and CCHD and this, that, and the other, and they wanted to look, well, what is what does it really add up to to have a community organization, membership-based community organization? Well, we got a professor, because there are a million professors looking for this kind of work. Look at everything, tell me what the benefit is. Ten-year period, even before the biggest of our minimum wage victories in, in 2006, we went to six or seven that year, $15 billion. We're talking about income transfer. Income transfer from corporations and others to the lowest income working, these are working families, minimum wage obviously, 15 billion, 6 billion of that was just on minimum wage campaigns. It's a big stop sign, but So unions, uh, I believe in unions, I believe in collective action, I believe in organizations, but of course I believe in unions. And the problem with unions, is that institutional labor has become a potentially minority unionism. The density now is 12% roughly, which means 88% are unorganized for the 12% that are organized. So unfortunately, unions have become elite institutions that, uh, where workers increasingly don't have the experience with collective action, so are disconnected from that in many kinds they don't see unions as a solution to the issues that they would normally, by default, have believed was a natural place to move. And this starts showing up more and more. As public sector workers, that's where we have the most density. Private sector, we have the least. And, uh, you know, this wasn't part of my remarks, but I love that. Look at this. 7.2 million union members in the private sector. That's 1 million workers less than the current number of workers unemployed in the United States of America. We have 8.2, hey, it's getting better, Obama's got a better chance, unemployment is improving, 8.2 million, and that's 
statistical. I'll let uh, others talk about how many people really might be unemployed. We're talking about statistical unemployment. There's a million, a million more people are unemployed than are in private sector jobs paying dues to unions. But uh, that'd be 104 million plus or minus the private sector that are out there to be organized. Even in the public sector, and obviously the pushback in Ohio, Wisconsin, Indiana, goes on and on. There's still 13 million of those unorganized. So that's my argument. Let's build a majority-based organization, association, union, community, worker coalition, whatever you might call it, that looks at how you build an organization among 100 million that are unorganized. There's no competition there. Um, but is there a structure, a strategy, a plan to move forward there? And 